Uh, just a short disclaimer at the start is that all the views that you hear today are my own views and not that of my club. And uh, while I am expressing the views, I'm hopefully not um, expressing somebody else's views um, through myself. So just just that's an important point. Um, Gard gave a, a good introduction there of, of, of what I've won really and what the, what the club has won as part of that. And what I'm showing you here is the is the role of honour effectively from our club, which I think is accurate yeah, up until at least last year. And in yellow is the period that I've been involved with and um, where I've had success with the club, but also then some of that has been passed to me. And I just maybe draw your attention to say, some success which started back in 93 with minor championships, um, followed through with under 21 championships and senior championships, and then obviously the Ulster and Ireland success that came in the back of that. Um, it's probably worth noting that um, while I played in four minor finals, we only won one, which I think is important as I develop this conversation, and because I ended up playing in five under 21 championships and won four of them. Uh, the fifth I lost by myself, uh, unfortunately, in this case. You will see this slide again, and I'll discuss that maybe just later on. And tonight's talk is about the transition of league football then into championship football. And I suppose it's worth taking some time just to reflect back on what league football means, at least at least to me, uh, in what league football means. So what I'm trying to do here is to try and outline what that is from an essential perspective. Okay, so league football to me is about building partnerships throughout the field, and what I mean by that is it's taking the opportunity to look to see how your centre half and centre quarters play together, how your full back and your goalkeeper might interact how your five and your corresponding then 10 or your seven and corresponding 12 uh, work together uh, about link play coming into the full forward line. So it's that opportunity to build partnerships and trade people in different positions or, or in different uh, formations and see how that works out. It's about experimenting with patterns of play. Now I've put systems in brackets because everybody talks about systems. Uh, I, I don't necessarily like to call it a system or you mean describe it as a system at least, because I see Gaelic football as, as, a, as a range of patterns of play that we simply put together and then somebody down the road puts a label on that and calls it a system. Um, so that pattern of play might be, uh, for example, how you uh, distribute ball into the forward. It might be how you break out of the fence, uh, transition uh, type football uh, and things like that. Okay, so I, I think I think that's important that, that we look at that. and. When you, um, when I hear then say former colleagues and uh, maybe current club or county managers nowadays talking about how they have had, um, had a good display but were beat because they had 10 or 15 or maybe 20 wides, you know, they often they often say we uh, we did really well but, you know, we're creating a lot of opportunities here, we're just not executing them. Uh, for me, that's a pattern of play which they simply haven't worked out how they transition the ball from defence to the quarter line and then link in the full forward line. So patterns of play should be worked out through league football um, and to give yourself that opportunity to tease out what type of players you have uh, and what they're capable of uh, or what you're able to translate to them uh, through whatever way you're doing it. So um, the next thing is about an education piece. Uh, it's about educating the players and yourself through exposure to various conditions. Now. What I'm talking about here is defending as an example. It's how to defend on a one-to-one -one basis. Uh, it's maybe how to look at scramble defending. You know, um, are we able to get back and scramble in and cover defence when we need to? Um, are we able to operate against a midfield partnership that's more dominant than, than us? Um, because if you're fortunate enough to have the best midfield partnership in the country, fine. If you're not, then you need to figure out how we can then either win kickouts or bypass a more dominant midfield and what better way to trail out different methods than, than doing it through a league system. It might be the opportunity to look at how you um, break down a mass defence and um, it might be how you cope with a man down or a man up. It might be how you carry the game to an op opposition um, and it, it, it's really just a bit adjusting to the various situations that arise and that education and exposure can only be done in the league and not only that, but must be done in the league because come championship, it's too late to try and trail or tinker with places like that. And then the final essential thing of what league football means to me is about exposing players to different positions. 
Now, if you're an existing manager who has 10 years experience with the same club, then maybe this is less relevant. But if you're a new manager to a club um, or a new manager even to your own club, then you really need to take that opportunity to throw people in different places. You know, is a half forward capable of playing wing half back? You know, how did new DQs end up being corner back and corner forward and excel in, in, in both places? You need to try and, and see, see what they're like in different places. Um, my current team that I'm training at the minute, which is the club on the 15 team, um, I recently had to move my centre half back out of centre half back into wing half back. And the reason for that was as a number six, he was unable to uh, retain some sort of shape in defence. He wasn't able to command the centre. He was breaking forward. Um, well when he was going forward but recklessly in relation to a defensive uh, system of some description whereas as a wing half back it allowed him the freedom to attack to get up the field his half forward to cover him if need be or even himself to try and get back because we weren't as badly exposed so so i, I now had a number six who i was planning to play there in championship he's now going to be a, he's now going to be a number seven um, and he'll be much more effective in that place so that that's again something that we should be tinkering with uh, with league football but while I have a number of points there which are essential, there are a number of things which I don't believe are essential and which I possibly think are overrated uh, when it comes to league football. The first is a wee bit controversial, I suppose. It's about winning games and developing that winning mentality. Is that essential in league football? I guess it depends on what your initial starting point is. If your ambition is to do well in the league and just compete and drive on, then that's fine. Winning games are important. Winning the league is important to you. But if you think you're capable of winning the championship, and not everybody is, if you think you're capable of winning the championship, then winning the league should not be a priority. And I say this because you cannot experiment, trail, uh, tinker with your team to to an, and with enough. Um, with enough changes on a week-to-week -week basis to try and identify what's best amongst everybody and still expect to win games on a regular basis. And you need to be able to take your players with you, your coaching staff with you, so that they can see that the bigger picture here isn't so much winning the league, but staying up in the league and being competitive in the league and trying and not giving up, of course, but winning 10 out of 11 games or whatever it is in the, in the league, league system isn't essential. To win in the championship. If you can do both, grand, but it is, but it certainly is not essential to win in the championship. Uh, the next point is about getting supporters on your side. So often when coaches go to different, um, uh, take over different teams, they want the parents to be happy, the club to be happy, the executive, etc., and, and the spectators and supporters to be happy. And again, if 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 what you're trying to do is to keep those people happy, you're you're not then doing what your job is. And again, your job is to try and develop your team and to put some sort of shape or discipline on them that reflects what you want to do as a manager. Yeah, and to do that will cause a level of disruption and annoyance for spectators until they accept that the changes are working yeah, and on your side. So if you want to keep everybody happy, it's a very short term view uh, and not one that will lead to success. The next one is, is, is this idea of a higher scoring ratio. Yeah, and I'm going to use a simple example here. Um, our own club at home there, Cross Glen, recently got um, a Hayden in the league. We could, we could beat seven goals and nine points to seven points um, by a team called Bally McNabb, who on the night were superb. Uh, quite a range, quite a spread of excellent footballers, played a lovely brand of football and were very dominant um, against Cross Glen team, which, which while they were missing players, uh, the biggest downfall in the night was the lack of application uh, to the game itself. So two weeks later, if we can step forward, um, Bally McNabb play in the championship and get beat by Madden. Now, that's not taking anything away from Madden, but what it is highlighting is that the high scoring ratio in league matches is, is a reflection of yourself and your own team and possibly the strengths of your own team, but also then the strengths or part more likely the weaknesses of the opposition that you're playing. And it can create a very false stone in relation to how you're preparing for championship football. I've put down the reverse of that has also been through in that a mean defence is, is not much better either. Uh, and certainly a mean defence whereby a mean defence is built on the back of 
you know, uh, double sweepers or mass defending from half forwards, etc., then the main defence does not allow you to transition pos properly into an attacking team. And, um, and there may well be some people out there from listening from, from Donegal. There's quite a few clubs in Donegal who would have very tight and mean defences and with high scoring rates in league football. But when it comes to championship football, um, this, differ this differs a lot. Um, and, and if I can, without causing offence in this case, is Kilcar would be one of them. Like you have a very impressive attacking team um, and hugely impressive right through the league and, and have been, and, but yet have been unsuccessful so far in, in, um, in club football championship in Donegal. So, so a mean defence looks great and a high scoring ratio looks great. If they both come together, yes, that might be possible, but individually and separately, um, I'm, I'm not sure that they're good indicators for championship success. So what is different then with championship? Um, the first thing for me is that a championship team must have a demonstrable clarity in the style of football. Now, what, what does that really mean? What it means is that in league football, it's error ridden and problems and you're not sure what the team looks like. Once it comes to championship mode, that team needs to be crisp. They need to be fluent in how they're set up in whatever shape that might be, even if it's sweepers or all out attack or play wide or play narrow or whatever the case is. The clarity that there must be visible to everybody. And everybody in this case is even the youngest of the spectators that's watching. So my son watching it needs to be able to see how the team is set up, what way they want to play, and are they actually playing that way? Because unless it's visible to everybody else, it certainly won't be understandable properly uh, to the players themselves. So that clarity m must be there. And I would contend at least that the best teams will have absolute clarity in how they're going to play or how they're actually playing. And the, the important point, I suppose, following on from that is that that clarity must continue throughout the game. And what you should not see is a is a return to whatever the default position was, either before the management that's currently there, or to whatever they've learned from, say, schools or otherwise. Like you know, whatever the pattern to play that they're doing is repeated uh, throughout the game at, at various stages. The second thing for championship is that, and, and it's it's an obvious truism, like that that the better teams make less mistakes, uh, and and we all know that to our cost, obviously. So those basic mistakes are are, are simple. Um, and you know what we're looking at here really is not just the handling errors or the kick passing errors, it's the turnovers, it's the tackling, um, it's the one-on-one -on -one defending as the case is um, because, um, because the better teams are simply better at all those range of basic skills and on all those skills I'm mentioning which is tracking players, one-on-one uh, -on -one defending, all of the stuff, they should all be considered basic skills at uh, championship level. Uh, the next one is obviously this, this idea of a raise in tempo. Okay, but you know, what is a raise in tempo? Well, for me, a raise in tempo is the proximity of a player to his opponent, uh, uh, being one, um, and therefore leading to a higher number of collisions. Uh, collisions being tackles, uh, phys physical contact. It's, it's a physical sport. Um, and for, me, for me, that physical contact is an essential part of championship football. And if you have players who have a close proximity but don't make tackles in, they're still a step away from what championship football should be, at least for me. Um, the other part of tempo, I suppose, if you look at it from a sports science perspective, it's the high speed running, it's the meters per second that they're doing, okay? Um, but I'm not quite sure where that fits in the club football, and I'll, I'll maybe come back to that. It's also about the crispness of the skills and, um, and not only the skills that we discussed before, but it's also maybe this idea of a mindset um, and that, that that mindset will be a much more positive uh, mindset when it, come, when it comes to the tempo. And that takes me into this, this intangible space, right? because we've, we've this whole space in football or in sport at the minute, I suppose. Um, and, and it's hard to, it's hard to uh, uh, discuss it probably, possibly, uh, because it's, a feeling, you know, it's it's how it feels to be in championship football. It's the mood, okay, but it's how you perceive the mood or pick up the mood. It's the atmosphere in the camp or in the stand at the team or in the in the club or the community at, at before my before the championship, okay. And that's back to that whole positive uh, mindset. But they're all intangible things, 
And the problem with intangible things, for me at least, is that they're so um, they're so different to each individual. Um, and I used to talk. We mentioned before there, but but Stephen Rochford, like Stephen used to, used to ask constantly, like, how do you feel? How do you feel today? What do you think this this looks like today? You know, and he'd have one opinion of it, and I'd have possibly an entirely different opinion of it. And Donny Buckley, uh, uh, Joe, or whoever it was was there at the time would also say the same thing. You know, and a different opinion to what it is. So intangible things are very hard to uh, uh, properly put your finger on. But the last thing that's different for me, and this is an important piece, is is the idea that you will have one chance in championship football, irrespective of it's, whether it's knockout or otherwise. In league football, casual shots, casual misses, uh, near defeats, near wins, probably don't make an awful lot of difference. It's just another game and you're walking through a process. In championship football, the good teams and the good players execute those chances. And when I look at my own club, you know, when I have a ton of players I can look back through that time period that I was looking at, from Jim McConville to Oshin to John, or the twin brother, um, right up now to Ray and O'Neill, uh, Stephen, Karen, Aaron, Karen, people like that always, when opportunities arise, are willing to take them and more often than not, execute in championship football um, and if, if there's a good example as any that's been in my time is that we played Ballina in an All-Ireland uh, final and um, with Liam McHale and David Brady in midfield and they dominated the game from start to finish um, but when the chances arose to win the game we took them, John in this case took them whereas uh, Ballina in that case didn't take them, we won the game seven points to eight points something like that but Chances were there and we took the chances. And I think that's an important difference in championship football is that the better teams will execute those chances. However, championship football for me is not win at all costs and it is not about the process. And uh, I suppose in my mindset at least, I think both those terms are unhelpful when it comes to club football and certainly in Gaelic football in any case. Uh, I don't think they mean anything uh, in any case. I think they both distract from the reality here and the reality in my view at least is that is that what we're calling systems to play is is uh, patterns of activities that go on the field and we simply put them together uh, and, I, and I, I say this because um, I once was in a changing room a couple of years back um, with players performing at the, at, the, at the highest level and getting prepared for big matches and to spend so much time looking at, like I'm talking about a half an hour and 40 minutes, immediately before the match, uh, the night before the match and at other periods of time for training sessions, etc. Turning to a book, to look in the book, to see what the book was saying about what they need to prepare, what their mindset needs to be like, what their um, opposition opponent was going to be doing for the day, um, what they needed to do for the day, uh, and all these triggers and KPIs and stuff they had to try and get in their head. And for me, if that's where our mind is, then then we're missing something here. Um, so it's not a, necessarily about the process and going through step by step by step. I think that is important in rugby and other sports like that, where you have stage steps going through it. Um, but certainly not in, in, in the sport that, um, that I play. So, how might I prepare then? Okay. Um, when we're looking at the change from championship to, or sorry, from league into championship, and I discussed this already, the first and most important point is clarity of roles and responsibilities. Um, it is important that everybody who's on the field and anybody who's likely to come onto the field has absolute clarity on what their role and responsibility is. And that's at every stage where that ball is on the field. So, if the ball's in the full forward line, what's the defenders doing? How are they looking around them? Are they aware of the situational awareness around them and so on and so forth? Um, if a ball, if you're in possession, then what is your options in possession? Um, because you do need options. The last thing you want is a player who doesn't know what to do because you, everybody needs some, some guidance. So they do need options. Um, and but on does he need options, but the runners need to be available for them. And a lot of that can be coached. Um, we tend to think about um, clubs and certainly in this case we tend to talk about managers or coaches or other stuff like that. We should be coaches 
um, we should be coaches and there should be then somebody who does additional work through SNC or whatever term you might want to use for it. I think a manager is moving away from our and certainly delegating responsibility that we should have because our primary role here should be to coach players to improve themselves and therefore the team as we, as we go along. The second thing is, uh, and this is after the league's over, uh, I'm talking about here, is that we should be, well, it's my preference is certainly to move towards game-based scenario training and certainly moving into this idea of having much larger pitch sizes, so into full, full, full games and pitches, whereby we can practice the plan that we've been working on and try and tease out difficulties live as they're happening. So that's our responsibility then as coaches or managers or whatever, to identify and correct those learnings and then try and get the players to reflect that. So get the players to identify and 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 uh, see what see what's happening, or what mistakes could be made, so they can they can um, self-identify the, the issues that's going on. And the last thing, just on the game-based scenario thing, is that the focus should be on us until we are absolutely crystal clear on what we're all doing, uh, and we should not be bringing in the opposition to our training session until such times as we are comfortable with what we're doing. Video analysis is where the opposition comes in, okay? And he can come in, the, the opposition can come in through, um, through looking at the weaknesses and strengths. It can also be used to reinforce your own learnings, okay? And certainly in my mind, um, and certainly in, in this day and age, okay, and I know this has changed quite a lot for me over the years, but in this day and age where video analysis should be used, it should be kept at 10 and 15 minute windows uh, where you want to come in, you want to look at a sound bite or whatever that is, either on yourself, or in your opposition, and then you use the training session to uh, implement whatever exercises you want to do to overcome or improve whatever it is that you're after watching uh, as an analysis tool. So I don't think it has to be any more complex than that. I, I, while county teams, each individual has access to the team and each player and so on and so forth, I think in a club scenario, uh, a lot of that is possibly overkill. But certainly it's something that should be used. It should be used frequently and it should be used in small bites. Uh, I do believe that sessions preparing for championship should be much shorter and much sharper, uh, which does include speed work on that. Um, I think if regular matches are, uh, sorry, if championship matches are occurring on a regular basis, so on a week to week basis, as is probably the case now, and if you had planned, as I say, you had the championship on a Sunday and you planned the train choose the tours to Friday, as an example, for a meeting and then play the following Sunday, uh, I think you should consider delaying your choose the session till Wednesday and cancelling your tours the session and if you have players missing and if you've started players missing. And the reason I'm saying that is because you need to be, they need to be learning during the activity, uh, standing watching the session or partaking while they're getting physio on and off the field is not helpful to the group and it's not helpful to the individual. So um, for me, it would be much, it would be much uh, smarter for me at least to say, okay, well, let's cancel choose the session, run the session on Wednesday where we will have all the players now available. We'll do a high quality session on Wednesday and then that'll do us till Friday, in which case then it'll be just a run around uh, before the game on Sunday. Um, and where where you're concerned about loads um, for the players or not having fitness levels or what some people call a stimulus, uh, if your matches are occurring on a regular basis, you don't need a stimulus for the starting players, but it may be something you might want to consider for subs or players you haven't who haven't come on at any stage for that matter. Um, for me, the focus in championship season is a technical and tactical space. Um, whereby if you're doing game-based scenario stuff and then you can pull out players on a one-to-one -one basis or on a, you know, two or three players at a time to do one-to-one -one coaching on them or coaching in small groups to try and focus on a point that you're not sure is getting across properly or you're not happy with how, how they're executing it. Uh, that might be simply a, a, an exercise looking at feet movement for tackling as an example or a positional sense as, as, a, as a full forward or corner forward and something you can just walk on on an individual basis and just pull them out of the group session. Uh, and in doing so, in championships, in, in preparation for championship football, I think players should expect low intensity periods. 
So periods of high intensity when they're doing hard work and periods of low intensity when they're walking through exercises or walking through drills or being pulled out of uh, exercises for certain periods of time. Um, I mentioned that already. Okay. And then the final point just on this is the championship season is not the time for new drills or new new ways to get people to think in respect to training. Uh, you don't need to come to the session every night with a brand new variation of the same drill. Uh, there was absolutely nothing wrong with repeating drills that the players know. Um, and I'm not talking about just a simple fist pass and exercise here. I'm talking about broader, more expansive drills. Um, because the players need to understand A, why the drill has been performed and B, how many options are available to both the person in possession and the person receiving possession when that drill has been executed properly or, or in some cases improperly. So I do believe that repetition is a very, very, very uh, underutilized things nowadays because everybody wants to be something new and keep it fresh and so on and so forth. Um, uh, it's just sort of something I, uh, I have a bugbear about, I suppose. So I mentioned before um, this slide, okay, uh, and I want to come back to it again um, because I want to make the point that in 2019, last year, okay, um, this club, Crossman Rangers, never won an underage competition. Now, below minor, I think, they, I think we won the minor last year, but it was 18 and a half years in Armagh the minor was last year. Uh, actually, maybe we didn't actually, but we never won anything there in, in underage last year in AMA. Not a single thing, not a single thing. Um, and I'm the underage development uh, coach in the club. And yet we see this, we see last year as a success. And we see it as a success because we never lost a single player in all age grades in from minor down. Now, minor up is a different story, okay? But from minor down, we never lost a single player. And that for us, is a success in relation to a year. Now, I'm going to compare that possibly to a club that, that I was involved with or in Dublin as the case is. And um, they had a, a, a very strong and a very impressive failure team. Uh, and they put, uh, they put huge emphasis on the failure. They won the failure, senior failure now in both football and hurling and had huge ambitions for this team as they were developing uh, through the years. Uh, there's a good few of that, that was in 2013, I think. Most of that team is now fit to play senior football. There's only a couple of them playing senior football and they certainly have not progressed through uh, through a system um, in, in the club, which put a lot of pressure and a lot of emphasis on success in early stage and maybe hasn't developed that through. So the philosophy of this club, at least, um, is about trying to develop senior players on the football field. It also has a separate you know, philosophy around social inclusion and community cohesion, which is maybe all part of the, the history of the club maybe coming through. Um, but what else it has is that it has no external coach at any level. Now that only demonstrates, the only point I want to make on that is that it demonstrates our ability to get past players re-involved in the club and to support it on the rich levels. Yeah, and you know, even now we have you know, Ashton McConville and myself, uh, John Stephen Kernan as the senior management, along with, Ash, along with Jim McConville. Uh, we have Gareth O'Neill, who, who is with myself, has won uh, um, uh, two All-Ireland clubs. He's now helping with the second team uh, in the junior championship. Uh, and we had a, a wealth of different uh, senior players throughout the years who have all been previous senior management or otherwise uh, coming through. Um, so I think our ability to, to bring talent back into the club or reinvest um, those people back in the club has been a huge success for us as we, as we go along. Um, and I think the challenge for us going forward as a club, uh, and we have more to talk about it, but I think the challenge for us going forward as a club won't necessarily be how we view the sport or in fact how GAA itself is, is developing with different patterns of play or otherwise. I think our biggest challenge going forward um, will be the GAA itself implementing rule changes and age grade changes, as as is the case with the under-17s, uh, and the difficulty that us as a club will have to meet our social inclusion and community cohesion and developing senior footballers philosophies when the age grades have been brought back from 18 and a half, as the case was, now down to 17. I think that's, that's our biggest challenge as a club going forward. So I suppose the question remains then is, can anybody win uh, championships? Uh, and I suppose the answer to me is yes, of course they can. Um, but there's a lot of caveats there. 
uh, clearly self-belief and confidence and you must have players available to you if you don't have players will you win a championship even if you want to it's unlikely uh, if you do have that then you need to completely understand whatever your game plan is going to be all right and you need to have the ability to execute whatever that game plan is under pressure and again that comes back to, to my previous point is that if you're under pressure will you default back to a previous system or previous plan or otherwise uh, the good teams won't the next thing then is about unity of purpose and alignment naturally of course you know we all need to be facing the one direction and of course you need to know your opposition you're not going to win a championship simply just looking at yourself all right and lastly that you need a book you need a bucket of luck but there are a number of pitfalls yeah, at least pitfalls that i see at least okay History, of course, is helpful. OK, history as Cross and Glenn gives us confidence, I suppose, but it's probably not essential and it's certainly not essential if you don't have that history. Um, and if I look at clubs throughout the country, I think one that comes to mind is possibly Trillock. Trillock and Throne probably don't have the history that Carrick Moore or somebody else has, but yet they're obviously competing for, for Throne championships. So history is certainly helpful, but not essential. Um, this idea of a, of a good manager um, is, an, is another thing which 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 certainly causes me problems um my my mother has a local shop and i was in at the weekend there and i, I met a young fellow who was who was playing for um he was playing for a club in, in championship weekend and he, he says to me or i asked him how are you gonna how he is fared out of the championship and uh, they were missing one of the players and he says he says the opposition of a really good manager and i says to him but he's not playing so, so what odds if he's a good manager yeah, and 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 th this is a problem. This is a problem too, because good managers are a uh, perceived thing that you know, I mean, like uh, whoever it is, is a really good manager. But good managers, guys, aren't necessarily people who win championships when you don't have players or systems or ways in place. Uh, the next pitfall, I think, is keeping up with the Joneses. I had a conversation with a team in Dublin uh, last weekend who rang me for an opinion. Sorry, two weekends ago, who rang me for an opinion. Um, on the his, his players wanted to play the 4-4-4 kick out strategy that Dublin and Kerry deploy every so often and they wanted this strategy for the game against a high quality opposition okay division one football and championship football in, in Dublin Um that's a sporting fad as far as I can see and not every team can deploy a 4-4-4 kick out strategy and get away with it um, there are others as well. The zonal events that Galway play, or possibly even Throne, but certainly Galway play, is not something that club teams should be trying to emulate uh, and, and and run with at any stage. Uh, even 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 the best of the of the club teams uh, shouldn't be looking at that. Um, the next thing for me, I suppose, is is the aspects of sports science. Um, and for me, certainly, I wouldn't be looking to GPS for answers to win championship football. Uh, we in Cross still haven't looked at GPS um, as, as a source of something that's going to help us win football. Uh, and, and part of the problem for me with this is because most of us, and myself included, um, don't have the ability or the knowledge to deal with stuff that sports science is churning out there. We don't have the ability and knowledge to properly uh, assess it, decide if it's right or wrong or otherwise. And, and we don't have the uh, funding or the ability as clubs to bring in sports scientists to be able to decipher that data and tell us what it means or otherwise. Um, and when you have when you have um, terms and phrases like player score index, uh, which is an index that allows you to rate players against what their expectation might be, and therefore tell them that they perform less or better than what they're expected might be. I don't see this as useful in relation to helping people develop. Uh, and certainly prepare for championship football. Um, sports ecologists um, or anything close to that aren't necessarily, aren't necessarily for everybody. Um, but I would say don't doubt yourself. Um, there is a pitfall in there is a pitfall out there somewhere that you know unless you have a sports ecologist, then you're not ready. You're not mentally ready, and and whatever else happens here. Uh, I think investment in sports ecologists is much more significant. Than, than what we as as a Gaelic footballers and coaches um, give it give it the time of day four when it comes to uh, playing, and therefore unless we invest properly in these things 
in which we tend to not have the resources or the time to do, uh, they tend to be more of a hindrance than a help. Uh, in saying that, there are a lot of people who benefit from these things and therefore it has a place. Um, but will it win you a championship? Not quite so sure. Two other things then, uh, one-off sessions. Okay, one-off sessions are particularly about bear for me and I do sometimes um, participate in one-off training sessions for people who are friends that ask. Um, but I see no value in these things if you're taking the session. If you just, if you want to go and speak to somebody and talk to the team about your experience and things of like this, then yes, there might be value in it. But one-off sessions where you're not familiar with their plan or what they've done beforehand or what they've been working on uh, or how they might set up or play or otherwise, I just struggle to see it as constructive um, for teams. Yeah, and the final thing, um, which is here is this idea of business as in sport. Uh, there's a lot of sport terms goes into goes into business, but there's a lot of stuff comes the other way as well. You know, we talk about uh, the, uh, in business, they talk about culture, but same in sport, we talk about this culture, and you must have a culture. Uh, you talk about having individual KPIs for people. Uh, this idea of stretch targets, um, the idea that Tom or somebody will take the lead on whatever the stuff is you're doing. Uh, that you're results driven, that you might have a leadership team, uh, a leadership team formed of whatever three or four senior players or juvenile player or, or new uh, young player coming into the squad. Um, those things, guys, I struggle to see any benefit beyond distraction and complication when it comes to winning championships and setting a team up. Um, that's it. I'd love any questions if anybody has any questions. I suppose just before we get on to the questions, a few things that, that I have in my mind are you talk about patterns of play um, as opposed to systems of play. And obviously you're, you're using you're using the league really as a trial, a ground and experimenting uh, for your patterns. But really your patterns are patterns around defence, transition, attack, as you said. So just just how does that differ from from systems or is just a different is that just a different terminology that you're using uh, I, I i understand people using systems as a broader term uh, roger as a term of um um you know like a system being say mass defense which includes say 13 players or all out attack which includes 13 players but when I talk about patterns of play, I'm talking about patterns of play which are um, connecting maybe two or three players or four players, um, and, and and therefore they're much more, um, they're, they're much, um, that there's certainly much much uh, smaller aspects of the game which just need built up over time and developed, rather than this idea of a mass defence or or say a two ma two man uh, sweepers or things like that. You know, uh, okay. I see patterns as as being much more uh, uh, can involve smaller numbers of players or may involve larger numbers of players, but but certainly have bite sized chunks uh, towards what might be seen as a system. OK, well, maybe just lead on from that. I'm just thinking this idea out there, maybe it's it's, um, it's something you hear Joe Brawley talking about, that cross don't really believe in systems, that they kick the ball all the time. If you go to, if you go to their training sessions, they're kicking the ball regularly, persistently all the time. But they do have some defensive systems or defensive patterns as well. Would that be fair? Yeah, I, 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 think that's, I think that's probably fair. I, I suppose if I, if, if I look at it now, and again, I, you know, I'll talk about my own experience just, just initially. Like this year with the on the 15s, uh, we haven't done a single box drill so far, uh, and, we, and we won't. Um, since we've come back to the field, we haven't done any, um, uh, uh, you know, heavy running of any description for that matter. Everything's been involved in, in, in the game-based training that we've been doing. So, so I would say that I would say that in my own experience, I am trying at least um, to uh, to be through to what we want. And what what we want is that we're asking players to lift their head in possession. Uh, that doesn't mean kick the ball forward. It means lift their head. And to do that, um, I think you need to move them away from box drills because box drills involve high contact, high intensity, and an inability to lift your head and see what's in front of you. Now, after that, then we're asking them to make a decision at that point, and that decision is either to carry the ball or to kick it on. And 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 how I at least um, 
manage that in the training field is that if they make the decision to carry it, when the option is to kick it, then we stop it and we ask why did you carry it instead of kicking it. Now I think if we can bring it forward to 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 our uh, current day seniors, probably at least, is that our current day seniors now, and this is from the last game against uh, Silverbridge in the championship, which is the only one we've played so far. The current day seniors are very much of the same idea. Um, they have um, a couple of high quality players, and um, what we're trying to do is to create space and deliver ball to those high quality players. Uh, and certainly as a team, we believe that that's easier done by playing um, a more progressive uh, forward type pass, uh, but not always, um, okay. than, than, a, than, a, than a transition which involves uh, players building up speed as we go along. OK, so you're coaching your team not to take any touch of the ball that's not necessary, that's not needed, to play with their heads up. What about when players lose the ball, Tony, then? What do you expect from a player when the ball is lost or possession is turned over? Uh, Roger, I think what, what you expect, <laughs> the same thing. I don't think we're any different there. Uh, and to be honest, that, 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 that's simply to track back and support, OK? And now, one of my challenges at the minute with, with my own team is, is that when we're out of position, is their ability to get back into a, that scramble defence type thing, so that we have the central defence covered, that we have people being picked up as they're making runners, etc. But uh, but again, in that space, we'll be no different to any other team that's that's practising defence at the minute, okay. which is to try and get some sort of shape. But what I'm what I don't want them to do is to just filter back into spaces, yes. um, okay. because because I I, th I think we have an onus um, as coaches for underage teams at least. Whatever happens in seniors is a different story. For underage teams, at least, I think we, we as coaches have an onus to develop players to be true to the sport. Yeah. Um, and and I, I certainly, I certainly, and it's only my personal view, is that I certainly, uh, I, I quince at least when I see, and, and we, I seen it last year in on the 14s in, in Armagh, um, where on the 14 teams are playing with sweepers, out and out sweepers now, rather than somebody who's just filtering back. Um, and I, I just think that that's a very, a regressive okay. step on the way to football. So I think that's a really key point. So we want we want players that are hard, that work hard, but who could get back with real intent to do something, not just to filter back into spaces. Yes. Yeah. Listen, I'm probably been a wee bit selfish here, but I'm also going to talk to you. But you talk about the intangible, and and maybe I didn't pick up completely on it, but. The intangibles is what it means to the players, to the community, to the group as a whole. In terms of yes, championship, uh, yes, in terms of championship, because because it's not so much what it means, it's, it's how it feels, it's what the mood is like, it's 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 the it's the senses you're looking at now, you know, and back to that space, you know, it's 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 when you go down to town, it's as people now talking about it, do they feel confident that championships coming up that we're going to win it as an example, you know, um, do do the players do the players feel that there's a change in 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 atmosphere now between what was league football and was casual yeah. and and getting along to what championship football now is, where there's an actual intensity about it, that there's yeah. a do a day aspect to it, um, that there's something actually to be won, um, because in all the championships that that we've won. I have no idea how many leagues we won, but it certainly wasn't as many. Uh, it might have been five or six leagues. Um, and I can assure you throughout all those times, we were probably a better team than the majority of the teams that we, that we played against, you know? Yeah. And as, as Sean and I used to say, you can find the sap rising in you when it comes to championship, championship time. So something like that. Um, yeah. What about enforcers? Now, a lot of people will say when it comes to championship, you need a few boys who can put it about, who can take it to the wire. Now, I'm not talking, I'm talking about still within the ethics of the game and all that, but you do need some do or die individuals in your team. Would you agree with that? Yeah, well, I would agree with that. Um, and again, I would agree with it within the rules rules of the game. I don't think it's necessary to, to go outside that. Um, but, but you do need you do need players uh, who are skillful and, you know, and silky and all that sort of stuff. But they alone won't win the championship. You do need somebody who's more aggressive. Now, in our club, we, we have some of those players at the minute. We wouldn't be blessed entirely with them. We might have James Morgan as an example, and we might have Callum Comiskey as an example uh, as, two, as two defenders that would be uh, aggressive and on that edge, on the edge of being maybe over aggressive by times. But but certainly without them, and, and in the past with the likes of, say, John Donson or Joe Fitzpatrick or people like this, um, we would have been blessed with players who, while not, certainly not the best players on the field or the most skillful players in the field, um, would be essential players uh, to any team. Okay. Um, yeah. 
Okay, Tony, so I'm going to ask a few of the questions now that have come in. So just, just is there still a place for that really tough, hard, uh, case hardening session that needs to be done, maybe not the week, obviously, prior to the championship, but weeks away from the championship, where you really put down a marker with players? Is that, is that something you would do? Uh, yes, it was something new. Clearly, clearly for league and pre-season and things like that. Uh, yes, and, and I think I, I actually think there's also a place for it. Uh, again, depending on your team. So, so say it was cross playing, playing a team which which they would have uh, no concern about. Said and they were after coming from I don't know intermediate championship and and you had no risk against them. Um, in preparation of that match, I don't see any harm in doing a difficult session early on in the week. In order to in order to recalibrate, like one of the dangers, and I talked about that team, uh, Bally McNabb, that that hammer cross in the championship, or hammer cross in the league, and then compete in the championship. One of the dangers of your sailing into a championship uh, game of some description is that you simply don't perform on the day, and nobody ever says, "Yeah, I couldn't put my finger on it," um, but you've sailed into it, uh, and and if you can see that coming, then there's absolutely no harm in doing a difficult session, which may go against all the sports science and stuff in the world, um, but. Sports science is no good when you've when you've lost that game. Okay, Tony, thanks for that. Um, just I, I, you've probably alluded to this, but how big a part do you feel tradition plays in championship success? Yeah, um, I, I did discuss that a wee bit. Um, so I, I think it certainly helps. I think it helps. It helps because there's a confidence and 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 you know from. Um, uh, you, you know that you have the ability or that you know when that that the opposition um, might have uh, doubts in their minds because they're playing some big team so so for example if you went in to play Corfin so whatever Galway team is playing Corfin at the minute are probably already on a on a hate into nothing because they think there's no way we can control this team they're after winning three or lines in a row they can't be beat and so on and so forth and under those circumstances um, tradition has a huge huge issue However, if you're a team that's coming through with um, good quality players uh, and you've been competitive either for uh, recent years in, in the latter part of the underage, minor, under 21, etc., then then you have the ability um, to forget about that that uh, that that history aspect too. Um, if I look at our own team, we started winning championships in 96 and um, I think we won one shortly before that, but it was 10 years maybe or more before that since, since we won a championship. And and therefore, while we have a history, it w- wasn't a recent history that we had. And um, I think I think with the combination of management and quality players, etc., you know, you need to look about a time when if you don't have history, about going on and trying to make your own history. So I, I think it's I think it's helpful. It's not essential as I mentioned before, yeah. uh, but something something you can use to your advantage if you have it. So I'm just thinking, Tony. Then for the vast majority of us out here, the clubs that haven't that tradition, how do you start it? You know, I remember talking to Adrian McGuckle about, you know, Ban Derry many years ago hadn't won championships either. We're we're playing the trade in Division Two, and just a group of players came together with maybe the right management or the right coaches or the right setup, um, and things just took off. How how does how do the clubs out there try to get that to happen? Well, well, well. I think what you're after saying is exactly is exactly that, and and this is the same for um, county football as it is for club football. There are a number of county teams out there who, with some more structure and discipline and so on and so forth, might actually perform much better than they are. And it's exactly the same for club football, um, where there's a lot of club teams out there who are teetering at you know maybe a level below the the current county champions, whoever that is, but could in any day beat them. Uh, and what and, and what may be missing is there is something simple like as I mentioned before here now about you know ideas around patterns of play, uh, looking at gaps where they have before. You know I talked to you before, but um, you know the the all all out uh, attacking teams uh, in, in league football, but can convert that into into championship success. There's clearly something that can be worked on there. If they're good enough to score up 15, 16, 18 points a match in league football, then. Then with some more effort and discipline, they could show up that defence, bring it down to 13 or 14 points maybe and win championship matches, you know. So so there's quite a lot of teams out there who, who have the ability uh, with a bit more organisation and structure uh, and maybe effort in some cases can win it. But those teams, let's be fair here, those teams that don't have the quality players, 
that cannot convert scores, that don't have the ability to show up defences, they're not going to win championships, Roger. You know what I mean? Like, like, so yeah. there's a lot of teams out there that simply are not going to win championships. Like, and their target should be promotion in the league or main, maintain their position in the league or even win the league, as, as some of the cases might be. And that's a very achievable target for most, most teams. Yeah. I think that's, we have to bear that in mind that some teams target, if you just get, like, for example, if you're Loch McCurry this year, your first year in Division One, your your ob- objective is to stay in that division to to avoid being coming back down again. So you may not necessarily be targeting the championship. So it's, I suppose, it's horses for courses. You talk, Tony, about um, clarity. And I think it's, it's so important. And I've heard Joe Smith talk about clarity of roles as well. How do you get that clarity and how do you impart that to your players that they know exactly what the role is and they know the overall plan for the team? Yeah, I, I, and, and, and for me, that's straightforward enough. It's it's the constant reinforcement of the same points over and over again, using the video analysis to reinforce that point um, and and bringing it to the individual player, not just to the group. So so and 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 that that's it. So it's it's using the group to explain it to it's reinforcing to repetitive drills or games or scenario stuff. It's stopping the games and, and recyc- recycling the same information. And that's where the repetition comes in here, Roger, is that unless you repeat it often enough, the message goes and a new message is coming in. And the, and players for the most part <coughs> simply don't somebody won't retain it, you won't get it. But certainly certainly um some people are, you know, I mean auditory, some are kinesthetic, some are visual. And you just need to be conscious of what that type of player you're dealing with is and try and give it to them in the way that they'll receive it best. Okay, so you really need to you really need to know your players then. Yeah. 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 Okay, so just another just one of these. I'm gonna ask about another two, Tony, if that's all right. Um, this is one here. So what would you say was the key to cross the success over the last two decades? And how difficult is it to sustain that success over such a long period of time? So the key success, first of all, was it was a was one good group coming through, um, that was able to um, support um, uh, um, a, a body of uh, good footballers. So I'm talking about there's a good group coming through, which was Ashton McConville's year, supplemented by the year below and the year above that, um, who won everything at underage level and, and then brought that through to senior. Um, so that that they they all came through on. So didn't all come through, but certainly eleven of that team came through to start on the first championship success win, uh, and eleven of that team then was added to with the likes of Donal Murta, Martin Calif, um, Jim McConville, and I can't remember who who else is on it, but but it was a mixture then of using what effectively and the the is, is not disparaging in any way, like but the older players and the newer players coming through in order to to gel a team and 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 bring that skill forward. So that so we were lucky in that we had this bunch of players. But a bunch of players that was brought through, uh, and that's where the club came into it here. Is that the club actually managed to bring all those players uh, through into senior success? Uh, keeping that going, then, um, we believe at least keeping that going was our ability to churn over the older players and replace them then with new kids coming through. So in my case, we myself and John, I think we quit at 32. Um, we had we played 13 seasons, I think, or something like that there in senior champs of football, and we lost. In the 13th season, we both felt at that stage we were beginning to slow down, so so we departed, and um, in came younger talent then to try and push on and drive through, um, and that worked. How do we know that worked? Because the following year we won back to back All Ireland's and won three Ulsters, as the case is, and went back to back All Ireland's. Yeah. So, so we know that works, uh, and in time since that, then we we've been now trying to brush over old talent. So this year gone past, there's five or six players who maybe stayed on a year extra than maybe they needed to. But uh, there's five or six players who have now moved on and we've brought in last year's minors um, and we've already integrated. There was two of them into the starting team that Stephen Cairn and, um lined out this weekend past. So it's that yeah. moving players on and keeping players. Now, I suppose somebody's going to say it's all lucky for cross. You have all that. Right now, we have 715 members. Uh, of that, we have 60 adult playing members. Uh, we are in a parish which has 1,500 families which services four clubs, three senior clubs and a junior club. So when we're not exactly blessed with riches that everybody might, might think we have. However, um, ourselves, Dana clubs around us for that matter, uh, do really well at trying to retain those players on the field. Okay, just <clears throat> final question really, just this is probably from, from the own point of view. You talked about retention, you talked about a minor team 
last year that you retained a ticket right from under 12, under 10, didn't lose any players. You mentioned also about bringing older players back into the system again as coaches, administrators, whatever. Um, what what is that? is there a secret to that? How do you do that? Uh, no, uh, <laughs> uh, I, I don't necessarily think think there's a secret to that. Now let me let me go back to the underage. There's a lot in that question, uh, Roger. Um, with the underage, we sit with the parents at the start of every year and we explain to the parents at the start of every year that this is about inclusion and development of the players. Um, we we have our challenges throughout the year to to adhere to what we say. Now, in fairness, it, it doesn't be smooth sailing. Um, so in my own example, in the 15s this year, we had 34 players at under 15. Um, half would be 15 year old and half would be 14 year olds. So we decided that um, we would put in two teams, uh, a division one and a division three team in the two 17s and then ensure that everybody gets football this year. The alternative being that they only play whatever it is, four or five subs a match and, and no, nobody gets games for every four weeks or something like that. Uh, now with COVID things changed a wee bit, but we put in two teams for the league um, and between injuries and that we're down now to 28 players. So we're back to one team. But back to one team hasn't changed our philosophy because we played Clevey last week in a on the 15 uh, league match and we started out with a strong team uh, or what would be the older team, I suppose, and um, played them for half an hour. And because of unlimited subs, we put on then an entirely new team at the start of the second half and we played them for the second half. Now we were 15 or 17 points up at half time and we ended up drawing the game. But but to us that really makes no difference because we all got game time. Uh, we all got uh, our ability to, to show our skills and display our skills, etc. Uh, and the kids all left happy that they actually got game stuff. So that's we try and replicate that at the different age levels. Uh, we try not to uh, split them up based on skill or otherwise. Um, and and we try to we try our best at least, I suppose, to to keep everybody involved, irrespective of their ability. Uh, and, and ability would be mixed in a lot of cases, Roger. So that's that's the underage thing. Um, when it comes through a wee bit further up, then I suppose we simply just ask the parents to come back in and help, uh, or ask uh, the former footballers uh, to come back in and help, uh, and more often than not, uh, to do, you know. So Tony, just sorry, I didn't see that as the last question, but there's just one that's come through to me here, just in a, in, in a WhatsApp. So just come through, do you think, the long kicking game, the cross play, sometimes it's detrimental to winning games, particularly in Ulster when teams play sweepers, sweepers and nullify this. Case example, last year's game uh, against, I don't know, in Ulster, no alternative to this game plan possibly cost them. Now, I don't know who said that question in, but I'm just read it out. Uh, yes, it's a fair enough question, but what I would challenge there is, is that, is that, um, uh, well, first of all, I should say is that in the past couple of years that that has been the case is that we went to Ulster uh, and that our execution of our plan has been horrendous and it hasn't it hasn't worked. However, I would say that that's not so much the plan, but a decision making process of the of the of the uh, players on the field or whatever was going on at the time. So so I think, yes, there is merit and totally merit in, in what that um, uh, person is uh, con contributor is saying. However, um, I, I would contest that um, the responsibility for this must lay with players on the field because the decision making process to kick ball into a sweeper is not the correct decision making process. And that's the part that we have to learn as a team in order to try and adjust yeah. and adapt because we should be able to, to and this is why I talked about um, um, patterns of play. We should be able to adjust to the scenario and carry the ball when it's appropriate and kick the ball when it's appropriate. And we should be better, better players and better teams are better able to make those decisions live at the time. And that's the, that's the reason why we need to move, or why we're trying at least to move towards a game scenario type stuff where we can make that decision. And if there is a sweeper in place, that when we can call out whether that was a good decision or a bad decision based on what's going on. But I, I, think, I think we will learn from that uh, because we've shown before we can learn from it uh, and still stay through to what we do. So th that's really the point that you made earlier as well. We're playing with the head up that if, this, if the long ball is not on, then you put it through the hands. If it is on, then you put it in. So it's good decision making. And a lot of your work is done through games as well. A lot of your coaching. Yes. yes. 
Sorry about this again, Tony, but there's another one just came in. It's a very short one. You never use the word stats. Is this something you feel benefits your teams uh, come league or championship? Um, so, so I'm not I'm not a huge fan of, of stats um, because I think there's a lot of confusion in stats at the minute. Um, I, I think um, I'm, I'm wrestling with this myself, to be honest, Roger. Uh, I'm wrestling with stats because um, a, a stat which states how many scores you missed of tells you what you know a stat that tells you how many break balls you didn't get is is, is what it tells you what you know if you haven't seen that yourself that you've been lo losing kickers or losing break balls you know i don't necessarily know if a stat is going to tell you something you know and the, the piece i'm struggling with is identifying stats which tell you something that is not obvious uh, and that's the piece i'm walking through in my own mind at the minute is to try and understand stats that are useful to you that contribute to what you're looking to do um so for example one such stat is um areas of the field where you lose the ball all right and then the impact that that has on the scoreboard so you know if you lose them the opposition's full forward line how many scores did they get from that a full back line and so on and so forth something like that is very useful to you because what is, what it can be what it can be what it can be used for is that in a game based scenario type of situation um if in theory did you lose the ball in the in the opposition full back line that they only convert say one point from all the balls you lose in there well then it means that a kick pass into a full forward is less risky than a fist pass that you're going to lose to somebody on the half forward line or the half back line and therefore it gives the players confidence to know that actually kicking isn't the worst thing in the world or a longer yeah. pass whatever that might be isn't the worst thing in the world and um, because the the return that they get at that isn't, isn't so bad because the alternative is this the alternative is this is that you log down um uh, unforced errors and the unforced errors are 12 or 15 but those unforced errors you know men are all but um and uh, meaningless if, if, if they're connected in, in the same way so in short, in short I, I have a running battle at the minute a personal running battle at the minute with stats trying to identify what stats are useful and what stats are not useful and um, to 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 contribute to the game that you want to play Okay, so Tony, just maybe I'm going to uh, finish off now. We come back just to how you answered the question three questions ago about, you know, developing your players, not getting hung up on one and losing at underage level, have the eye on the, the bigger prizes, developing good players for your club in the future, adult players, whether that be reserve or senior, whoever's players is going to represent your club well. I think that is a key thing for me that I picked up tonight. Tony, can I just thank you for just as a really, really, very insightful. I could talk to you all night. So interesting. I suppose we're all football people and we could talk about football all night, but fantastic stuff. Thank you very much, Tony. We really appreciate you delivering this webinar again tonight. So good luck with your under 15s a year and all the best to cross as well. So thank you. Thanks very much, Roger. Cheers, Tony. Thanks,